Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Before we get started, just a couple of brief announcements. The first one is August 14th through 16th, 2020. Our friends at IANS, which is the International Association for Near-Death Studies, are having an online afterlife conference. Not just near-death experience stories, which there'll be many, but also talking about grief and other afterlife topics. It's over 60 percent It's a low price, video replays included, and because of what's currently happening in our world in 2020, uh, a lot of people can't get out, so we couldn't do a a live conference in person, so this is the next best thing. You can go to ians.org to find out more. We also have a new calendar at wedontdieradio.com, and we're doing upcoming courses on the afterlife, on spirituality, on tapping into your psychic abilities, because we all have them. We do an online Sunday service now, lots of demonstrations and much more. So again, you just click on the calendar link to find out more. Now on to our show. Our guest today is Dave Kane, and he is the father of Nicholas O'Neill, who at 18 years old was the youngest victim of the fourth largest nightclub fire in the United States history. And that was in 2003, where 100 people lost their lives. However, after receiving many signs from his son, Nikki, Dave knows he has not lost his son, that love never ends, and that he has been given the priceless gift of a loving, eternal connection with his boy. Dave is a performer, comedian, 40-year radio talk show host, and author of the book, 41 Signs of Hope. You can find out more on his website, which is simply davecane.net. Kane with a K. Dave, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Boy, this is great, Sandra. You made me want to read the book. Well, that's what I try to do. That's my <laughs> job. <laughs> Well, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. And I know we haven't met and I know we're not too many miles away. We're both in the currently in the same state of Rhode Island in the United yeah, States. Rhode Island. Right. That's right. That's right. So, Dave, tell us a little bit about you and your story. And well, about- um, uh, the, the bio, first of all, the bio you got, I got to change it because it's 50 years now in talk radio. That's how old I am. Wow. And uh, and uh, I am. Um, well, I, I, you know, I've been a performer, as you said, et cetera. And uh, my son, Nicky, uh, was also a performer. This is a kid who, who took four guitar lessons and wrote 50 songs. Wow. Uh, he, he wrote a play a year before he died called They Walk Among Us. The play is about teenagers who die and come back as angels. Incredible. He, uh, the, the, the name of the book, 41 Signs of Hope, is based on Nicky's number 41. You know, we all have. Lucky numbers, right? right. I mean, the numbers that would mean something to us have a significance of some kind. Well, Nikki's was 41, but it had no significance to him that he understood. Uh, we looked it up with numerology and we tried to find out what this was all about. And we couldn't really seem to make a connection. Well, when Nikki passed, he was 18 and 23 days, 41. The station nightclub where the fire happened is at latitude 41.41. The fire call box at the station was 4414. And on the cover of my book is a sketch of Nikki from a videotape we found a year after he passed. A friend of mine did the sketch from the videotape. And in the, in the, on the tape, uh, my wife is holding him. He's about four months old. And he has a little baseball uniform on. And the number on the cap is 41. Hmm. And it continues and continues. Now, beginning the day after the fire, we got our first sign. And it just piled from there. Wow. Can you take us back a little bit? I, I don't want to rehash sure. tough territory. No, no. A fine. lot of yeah. people hearing this show were joined by grief. And um, and it's awful to go through. Of course it is. But on the other side of it and doing what you are now, service, being of service and helping people is important. So if you don't well, mind well, taking us back a little bit. To, to what? What would you like to, to know? Well, I, I think um, a little bit about what happened as far as the fire, what what, what it was all sure. about, uh, where it was. Yeah. 
Yes, sure. Nikki had a had a band, and uh, his band had appeared uh, at this club in, on New Year's, and his band was supposed to open for the for the band Great White right. uh, on Friday night, and Nikki went on Thursday. Now, this was a a little restaurant it used to be called Pete Barillo's when it was first built, and the capacity was sixty people. Uh, when the fire happened, there were over four hundred people in that club. Wow. Uh, of course, totally illegally. The right. fire marshal fudged numbers and did outrageously horrible, illegal things. Uh, Nikki had gone that night, the night before the, his show, to, to see how the room was. And and that's how 100 people lost their lives. And 200 people were horribly disfigured by this fire. I mean, they lost limbs, etc. It was horrible. And uh, and and so the grief was insurmountable for us. Um, but I my you know, everybody has their own way of dealing with it. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I had been in the media all my life. I've been a disc jockey and a performer and a talk show host and and done news and everything. And and I guess I just kicked into talking about the horribleness of this this tragic event and how it could have been avoided. All of my friends in the media, of course, were calling me to talk about it because they knew me. Right. And and uh, we put up quite a struggle to get remuneration for some of these people, which, of course, you never can. Uh, and we just built this beautiful uh, park that we had to fight to get the land for. Because the owner of the of the property uh, had promised to give us the land after the, uh, you know, the um, litigation was over. And then he re- reneged on that and didn't do it. And so we couldn't raise funds for a memorial because we didn't own the land. And so that that begat another problem, another fight. What a shame. What a shame. Mm-hmm. Your son- yeah, it's been 17 years. My oh. son, what? Son. Yeah, oh, your son, Nikki. I think it's absolutely extraordinary that he wrote the play, They Walk Among Us. Um, he wrote, so, I'm sorry. Was there, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's hard when we're not face to face because you and I yeah, are both ahead. talkers. <laughs> but I, but when they, he was growing up, I mean, did he, did he seem like a spiritual kid or like he, he always had this kind of belief? Uh, yeah, he was always spiritual. He was, uh, uh, he, uh, when he was a little boy uh, and they'd go to, to mass, uh, they would, we would, Br- Br- Nikki would be asked up by the pastor and he would stand on the altar and tell a joke <laughs> at the end, <laughs> at the end of the mass. Uh, he appeared of course in the, the, the productions and the, the, the camps and all that other stuff at church, but he was spiritual within himself. Uh, if you were at a party and uh, with Nikki and he saw somebody sitting in a, in a corner uh, you know, not having a good time, he would be lying to that person. He would do all that he could to make them laugh. He loved to make people laugh. Uh, he was just gregarious. Uh, he wrote all kinds of beautiful prose and poetry. And the lyrics to all of his songs, as I said, he wrote 50 songs. Uh, we have a, a CD with you know, just a collection of some of them. And you would never believe that, that at the time, a 16-year-old boy would write music like this or write lyrics like this it was it was astounding yeah that's pretty great that's pretty great so let's move on to the signs because i'm i really feel just everything i've read and seen about you that you've got that connection still so what started happening because obviously you're in deep grief you're with your family and there's nothing that can replace a person, right. but what started happening that you well, well the first the first thing that happened the very first sign was the morning after the fire now we had been up all night we had gone back and forth to hospitals we had gone back and forth to what i i was at a, a hotel in in rhode island uh in, the one in uh warwick i can't remember the name of it now uh the big hotel crown and, plaza, and, maybe? thank you yeah. crown plaza and we we, we were sent there to find out where Nikki was, because this was the night of, you know, it was right after the fire. And as I sat there, because of my background, I could see that they were setting up a grief counseling center. There were all of a sudden nuns. There were ministers that I recognized, some rabbis. There were the Red Cross came in. They were setting up tables. 
And my wife was in total shock. I mean, I had to literally direct her, take her by the arm and walk her places. Um, and uh, I knew what was happening. And of course, I didn't tell her. But I knew we weren't there to find out what, you know, where Nikki was. We were there to have somebody tell us that he had passed. Um, the next day, the next morning, I got a call from a medium, Cindy Gilman, who's in East Greenwich right now. And she left me a message. In the, and this is, a, you know, cell phone, not uh, cell phone time with, you know, before voicemail and all that other stuff on my answering machine. <laughs> and it said, uh, I heard what happened. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. So I called her and I said, and I was surprised because we hadn't publicized about Nikki yet. Nobody knew about him, you know, except our family. And so I wondered how, and so I asked her, I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, I saw the fire on TV last night. You know, it was broadcast on television. Uh, it was so huge. And she said, I just thought I'd come on the air and see if I could help people who had, you know, who had lost people there. And then I told her about Nikki and she said to me, boy, I should have said something. Now you're talking about grief and you're talking about how you are at that moment. Now I believe in believed in mediums and I used to have her on my radio show a lot doing readings for people. Right. Mm -hmm. So when she said that, my first thought was, oh, great here. Now I've got a medium that's going to tell me that she knew something she had no idea of. And as you can imagine, I wasn't in a good mood that morning. No. So I hung up on her. I was infuriated. I thought, you know, I love this woman. I thought she was so good. She's smart. She, she's really got talent. And she's going to tell me this. I was infuriated. So two days later, I calmed down a little bit and I called her back to apologize for what I said and uh, hanging up on her. And she said, no, no, you've got to hear this story. She said, now, she stayed up most of the night watching the fire on television, and then she finally fell asleep, and the next morning she got up and made herself a cup of tea and sat at her kitchen table, and she had what she said was a vision of a charred boy who said to her, please call my father, please call my father. Now, she had no idea who this was. It shook her up, got her very upset, and she just went to her own personal phone book and flipped it open. And it flipped open to the K's. And my name was the only name on the two pages. So she said, well, I'll go on Dave Kane's radio show and talk about this. And we'll find out who this boy is. She had no idea it was Nikki. That's it. Wow. And that was the first sign. And then it started. And it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Tell us. <laughs> Go on. We all want well, to have okay. signs. Well, uh, okay. Let me see. That that same weekend, I had a show to do. I was performing. I do a character called Father Misgivings. It's it's a one man show with an Irish Catholic priest, Father Patrick Aloysius Misgivings. <laughs> Funny. And um, and it, the fire was on a Thursday. The show was on a Saturday, and we had two hundred and fifty people coming to the show. Now. I'll tell you why I did the show in a minute, because that's another story. But but just I was setting up for the show on that Saturday morning. And in the show, I, I sing a song called He. He can turn the tide and calm the angry sea. And as I started to try to, you know, rehearse it, I fell apart. I was crying. And I said, <clears throat> I said to Nick, Nick, you've got to help me. You've got to help me do this. Uh, I'm not going to make it through. You've got to help me. Well, this was at an Elks club. And just as I said that to him, some clock rang behind me on the wall. And I thought, oh, great. This clock's going to be going off during my show, you know, and messing up punchlines. And I, again, not in a good mood. And I yelled at some woman that was setting up the room. Hey, is this clock going to be going off during my show? And, she's, and she yelled to the manager, Bob, did you, whatever. Well, the clock was not a clock. The Elks have a, a, a bell in their hall. And every night at 11 o'clock, whoever else is there, they have a drink to the Elks that have passed. And somebody presses a button and rings that bell. Nobody pressed the button that morning. So as soon as I asked Nikki for the help, that bell rang. 
Beautiful. Okay. Now, I know you talk about mediums a lot here, of course, and you talk about grief and you talk about, let me tell you a story that, that I think you really, are you familiar with Robert Brown? I'm not. Robert Brown is an international medium. He's from England. And my, our son, Chris, Nikki's brother, Chris, found one of his books at uh, Barnes and Noble and he brought it home to his mother. The name of the book, by the way, is We Are Eternal. We Are Eternal by Robert Brown. I think it's in reprint now. And my, this was the only book that gave my wife any solace. It was the only book that helped her. And she was reading it one night and uh, in bed, and she got tired, so she put the book down on the floor. She took her glasses off, put the glasses on the book, fell asleep. The next morning, she woke up, looked down to make sure she didn't step on her glasses, and on the book and her glasses was a giant white feather. Now, we don't have a down comforter, <laughs> right? This is, we don't know where this thing came from. Mm -hmm. Now we feel we, – we, we call them – angel feathers you people do get them a lot yes and so she said that's it i've got to go see robert brown so she she wrote to him not telling any details of course she wrote to him and about a week later his secretary called us and said that we had we could have his first appointment when he came in from from england on the first weekend in october and we of course took it we were excited uh in new york we're great, except the first weekend in September, I had two heart attacks. Oh, geez. And quadruple bypass surgery. And a month later, I'm on Amtrak going to New York. A month later to see this guy because we wanted to see him. Mm -hmm. And for an hour, this man told us stuff. Not only could he not know, he told us stuff we didn't know. He told us. Now, now there's video of this fire. Uh, on the internet and you can see where Nikki is in the fire. And that's another whole thing. But he, uh, he thought we were from nine 11 when he, when he got the feeling that mm -hmm. he thought we were from nine 11. So for an hour, he told us where Nikki was standing. He told us a story that Nikki stopped and tried to help a woman who had thrown herself on the floor in panic. And three years later, I met a woman who survived the fire and she told me the exact same story about Nick. At the end of the reading, Robert Brown said to us, your son, he looked at me and said, your son wants me to tell you one more thing. He wants me to sell, tell you that the show must go on. Now, what he didn't know, what only my wife and I knew, is that the very last time Nikki and I were together was the night before the fire. I was giving him a ride to his girlfriend's house. His band was going to open for Great White on Friday, and I found out he wasn't getting much money for the gig. And I was, you know, teasing him. I said, you know, Nick, it's show business. Got to get your bucks. If you do it for free, they'll let you. And he laughed and smiled and rolled his eyes at me. And when we got to his girlfriend's house, I said, honey, I didn't mean to pick on you, but I don't know why you'd sell God's talent so short. And he gave me a hug and a kiss. He said, Dad, because the show must go on. He got out of the car. Wow. So the very last words my son spoke to me were told to me by Robert Brown in New York. Mm -hmm. And we knew without a doubt that this was Nick. There is no doubting it. Unbelievable. It's Nick. And would you like some more? Yes, I would. <laughs> We've got the time. I'm on okay. the edge of my um, seat. <laughs> okay. Are, are you familiar? Uh, well, uh, how about this one? Are you familiar with EVPs? I sure am. Yes. Well, Electronic uh, voice phenomena. Right. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know how much of your audience is. is uh, you might want to give a little overview. Just basically, to... basically what it is is that people all around the world collect the voices of people who have passed. Uh, they send messages. They say things. And they catch them on tape or on digital, and, and they have them. We got one. Uh, my wife went to see Maureen Hancock. Uh, um, she's had a national TV show for a while. Oh, and she's great. She is good. Do you know Maureen? I know her sort of. I've, I've she channels her, Nikki. But... Unbelievable. Oh. Yeah, she's really great. And um, 
Now I just lost my train. Oh, EVPs. EVPs. So, so, so Joanne and Maureen had a session and Maureen said, do you ever hear Nikki call you? And she said, well, sometimes I think I do in the house. She said, well, this time he's telling me that he's going to call you and there'll be no mistaking it. And on the, the tape of that session, <clears throat> Chris, our archivist, Chris, Listen to the tape. And right at that point when she talks about Nikki calling his mom, you hear a little boy's voice say, Mommy? Like that. Aww. Now, that got written up in a journal of people who do this, EVP journal. And a woman contacted me from Southern California by email. And she said, Mr. Kane, I think your son is sending me EVPs. And my first response, Sandra, was nutburger. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. Boy, here we go. Now they're coming out of the woodwork, right? Right, right. But you know, I never turned anything down, and I never turned my back on anything. And so I contacted her, and she had sent me one EVP that, that she told me. Now, th these are – you've heard them, Sandra, right? Yes. They're, yeah. they're, like, they're like shortwave radio broadcasts. They're, they're, they, they wobble, and they're tough to sometimes. And you have to have a good ear. You know what it's like? It's like when you look at that picture with all the colored dots on it and you're supposed to see the submarine. <laughs> right. You know, and I can never see the submarine. I, I compare it to learning a foreign language. If you don't know the language, you're not going to pick up on it. You really have exactly. to fine tune yep. your ears. Yes. Yeah. Right. You got to hear it. It's like someone with an accent. It, it, it's a whole deal thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, she sent me one that said, Joe's Nick's mom, Joanne, my wife, Joe's Nick's Mom, okay. Then we had another one, which I got to chat about in a minute, which is you hear her, whoever this woman's voice say, Nicholas O'Neill, like that. Like, like it's his turn to talk. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there's people in a circle and maybe there's a microphone in the middle, right. you know, and they called his name. That So I didn't know what that was about, but that was tough. Then on a Sunday morning, I get, a, I get up before my wife and I'm online and I, th there's an email from from uh, this woman. And it is, she said to me, please tell me if this is your son. Margaret Downing, by the way, is her name. I just thought of it. Margaret Downing. Okay. Uh, she said, please tell me if this is your son. And I clicked on it. And as God is my witness, Sandra, and I will send you a, a be glad to send you the copy of this. It is Nikki's voice. It is absolutely Nikki's voice. And he says, Mom and Dad, this is Nick. Wow. It's astounding. Mm -hmm. It's astounding. Uh, I'll tell you one of my favorite. Stop me anywhere you want. Here, no, we've way. got the time. I'm just sitting okay, here with good. my coffee and we're not in any hurry. And you we, don't have and any breaks to hit either. <laughs> no breaks. This is just what we do. But we, th there's a lot of people that are grieving the physical loss of yes. somebody listening right now. And these stories give hope of what's I possible. I hope so. Yeah. They do. Yeah. So as yeah. many okay. as you want to share. Oh, I, I've got a ton of them. i got a book full. Um, <laughs> and we'll talk about the book too. By the way, I do want to mention, and please make a note to yourself, and we'll talk later. I'm writing another book. And it's called 41 Signs of Hope, Your Stories. Oh. And I'm inviting people to write to me and tell me their instances. And I'm going to make a book of them so that they'll have the validity of having been published and, and, and they'll be able to show other people. Perfect. We've got lots of people that would, I'm okay. sure, would love to contribute to that. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I hope so. Okay, so here's one of my favorite stories. Uh, when I do my presentation, and I do presentations to hospice organizations and to college nurse death and dying classes, I explain to them that when, especially even in hospice or even in just, you know, in the nursing uh, profession, someone is about to pass and they see their Aunt Tilly, you know, mm -hmm. and somebody says, oh, you know, it must be the medication. And my job is to say, no, 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 it's not their medication. It's their Aunt Tilly. That's right. You know, they're, they're, they're coming to crush you over, to be with you. Uh, and so I'm trying to educate uh, health workers so they will have an appreciation for it and be able to spread that to the 
the patient's family who may be standing there, you know, and say, you know, this is not the medication, you know. So anyway, uh, when the thing that drove my wife crazy, crazy, was that Nikki may have suffered in the blaze, Mm -hmm. that he felt the flames, that he was in pain, that he, however long it may have lasted. It drove her crazy. And every medium we went to, Maureen Hancock, Cindy Gilman, Robert Brown, Lisa Powers, we and we've been to plenty. They all said the same thing. No pain. That was the phrase they used. No pain. When we asked them, they'd say no pain. When they, we didn't ask them, Robert Brown, we didn't even ask him. And he said no pain. So this had gone on. But still, every once in a while, I mean, it's his mom. Joanne couldn't let go of it almost. And one year, about seven or eight years ago now, we would we would we were tagging a Christmas tree. Nikki loved doing that. So we go every year and we tag a Christmas tree and and we were doing it and that day um Joanne was, you know, in that mode about worrying that he suffered. She was tearing again. She was, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, and being the kind, gentle, loving husband that I am. I was screaming at her, <laughs> right? Yeah. What is the matter with you? When are you going to get it? How many times is this kid going to tell you he doesn't want you to sad? He doesn't want you crying. He wants you to know that he is well and safe and felt no pain. Remember? No pain. Everybody told us, Cindy Gilman, that, no pain. Robert Brown, no pain. Maureen Hancock, no pain. We get in the car. and We're going up the hill from the Christmas tree farm. And I don't know why, but I said to her, for God's sakes, Joanne, what do you want this kid to do? Put it in writing. And as soon as I said that, a car coming from the other direction had the vanity plate, no pain. No kidding. Oh, my God. Now, that was owned by an anesthesiologist who lives in Lincoln, Rhode Island. Uh, I was able to get his name and I called him and he gave us permission to use the, the image of his, his license plate in my book. And in, in the movie, there's a movie, by the way, 41 about Nick, an award winning documentary. Fantastic. And, and, and so and so you see what I'm talking about. You, you couldn't. There's a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of these signs, don't you think a lot of these signs, you can write it off to coincidence. Yes, of course. A lot of these signs, you're like, oh, well, it just happened. Uh, oh, big deal. So what? I could do that, too. And blah, 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 all of the denial that goes on around this stuff. But it got so big that I finally had to write a book. It, I mean, there are tons and tons and tons of stories. Under my bed, uh, my wife, had, uh, under our bed, has a box of journals with all kinds of stories in the journals. And I just thought of a really good one. Okay. <laughs> and now this is a little convoluted, so stay with me. Well, okay? we love convoluted around here. Okay, because, so. I mean, it kind of goes ever to think of a chance in. Okay. All right. For years I had, I say for years, many times I had a guest on my radio show, uh, Susan Apple on her name is, and she was a, Co-author of the book, uh, life, uh, second book, Life After Life. She helped write that. And she was on my show several times. Now, Susan is a, is a she calls herself an intuitive and not a medium. Mm-hmm. But she's a medium. But anyway, she, she calls herself an intuitive. But she's also a psychologist. Now, now, hang on to this, right? Okay. A couple comes to her in her capacity as a psychologist. And their marriage is falling apart because their son committed suicide Mm -hmm. it's of course nearly destroyed them and one day after several sessions one day the the husband confesses or admits or or tells that he thinks he's losing his mind because he is imagining that his son is sending him signs so Susan says, no, 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 you're not crazy. You're not, no, no, th- no, you're not. Cra- this is real. This is real. You've got to talk to my friend, Dave Kane. The husband says, no, I don't want to talk to anybody. Shut her right down. Wouldn't talk to her. A few months later, the wife drags the husband to a medium in Philadelphia. And in that session, their kid comes through like gangbusters. 
He's given social security numbers. <laughs> you know, he's designing people. I mean, he's, I mean, they know this is their boy, like we had with Robert Brown. Mm-hmm. They know it beyond a doubt that this is their boy. And at the end of the session, this medium says, by the way, I want you to know there was somebody else with him. There was a young man who helped him come through. And the boy's name is Nicholas. Oh. Now, they don't know who Nicholas is because, you know, Susan never got that far. Mm-hmm. So they go back to Susan a couple of weeks later and they tell her the whole story. And then they mention this thing about Nicholas. She said, that's the boy. <laughs> that's the boy I'm telling you about. That's the, that, that's. So now the father calls me. And I told him, I hope you packed a lunch because <laughs> you're <laughs> going to be here a while. Yeah, right? yeah. And I proceed to try to validate for this man that his boy is coming through because I know that this is Nikki's bringing him to me. Mm-hmm. I must have talked to him for an hour. OK, so now it's over. My wife comes home and I say, wait till you hear this story. And I tell her the story. And my wife says to me. What is his name? What is his name? I didn't know why she's asking me that. I said, okay, his name is Eric Stark. She said, oh, wow. I said, wow, what? She said, the, she said, the last dream that I had when I woke up today was about Anya. Now, Anya was a little girl that my wife used to have in daycare. And I used to see Anya and I'd say, ah, don't get any Anya. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Funny. When... Anya's last name was Stark. Her father's name was Eric. Hmm. So here's Nikki telling his mom that he was the the Nikki in that other Eric Stark's reading. How cool is that? It's so cool. And you're just making me think here. Everyone should keep a journal. And it, yeah, write it and down. we we chalk these things up to our imagination, but you start, you know, and our mind doesn't want to remember these things. I, I think it's constantly looking for guilt and fear and worry and all those things. But write them down as they happen, yeah. and yeah. then you'll start maybe seeing commonalities and a thread here. And you know, one of one of the things I think that keeps people from investing in this or buying this. Uh, I talk about this. I get. I used to get a lot of women in my talk when I do the talk. I'd be mm-hmm. mostly. I do churches and all that stuff, and I. I mostly women. Uh, I've actually opened for a couple of mediums. <laughs> I've done part of my show for a couple of mediums, yeah. but mostly women. Men are starting to come around now a little bit, but I call they suffer from the Santa syndrome, and this what I call the Santa syndrome. The Santa syndrome is. When you were a little girl, or you were told about Santa Claus. That's right. And then you find out, well, maybe not. Yeah. And then you're told about the Easter Bunny. Mm-hmm. And you go, oh, well, no. And then the Tooth Fairy. That's right? right. And so what happens is, especially men, the men are afraid that Lucy is going to move that football. The men are afraid to invest for fear. It isn't true. Everybody wants it to be true. Nobody doesn't want it to be true, but they are so afraid that there's nothing after this. They are so afraid that they're going to be sucking into something. And what I tell people, and maybe somebody who's listening to me right now needs to hear this. What I tell people is, look, you're in this room, you're listening to me talk. If I'm wrong, if I'm just full of bullpucky, if I'm wrong and you die and there's nothing, it won't matter. But if I'm right and you don't invest in this, you will spend the next 30, 40, 50 years of your life not having any hope, any calm, any peace, any faith. And you'll step over the line and say, damn, Cain was right. That's right. And I wasted all those years doubting, mm-hmm. fearing. Etc. Invest in it. Open up. Think of the possibilities. It can be. You know, Nick, in Nikki's play, the last thing in Nikki's play, Grace the Angel says to the boy they're trying to help, in the end, everything, and I do mean everything, is going to be just fine. And the last line in the in the play is, "Do not fear to hope," and we put that on Nikki's headstone. Oh, that's so nice. So. 
open yourself to it. Don't be afraid. You're not crazy. You're not imagining it. These people are trying to let you know what Nikki let people know, that there is nothing to fear, that in the end, you will be loved unconditionally, beautifully, and you'll be safe. You know, this was, I mean, for Catholics or Christians, we believe personally that this is Nikki telling us that Jesus' promise of eternal life is no bull. I'm mm-hmm. living it. I'm living it. That's right. And so that's what, and, and they need to know, by the way, that this stuff with mediums, it's not of the occult. It has to be coming from a loving God, regardless of what you call that God, regardless of who it is. Okay. Allah, Buddha, whoever, it doesn't matter because it is coming from love. Everything that we've experienced from this experience has been of a positive, loving, wonderful, supportive nature. I agree. A hundred percent. And a lot of the scary stuff that we hear about is TV shows that, you know, get some more time on TV and all that, you know, it's yeah fictitious. And uh, well, I don't believe in negative. I don't believe in negative spirit. No, I don't give it any credence. I don't allow it. When I get questions about it in my talk, I tell them, forget about it. It's not going to happen. It doesn't happen. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And some of the best teachers, and even Arthur Finley College, I don't know if you're familiar, in the UK yeah. has taught mediumship for long, 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 long time. And don't, no, no on the negative. And the way our human beings, we exist is what we focus on tends to appear. If you're going on a trip to Hawaii, next thing you're going to notice is everybody's wearing a Hawaiian shirt. If you, you know, if we think about something negative, our minds can create it, but it's our minds. It's not the afterlife. It's not them. It's, it's us. It's all about fear. They all, they fear everything. Right. And this is the problem. It's the fear that gets you. And there's nothing to fear. I mean, you know, come on. Uh, and, and my son is, oh God, he's tap dancing as fast as he can. I mean, he does stuff you wouldn't believe, you know, they're, they're just some of it. So inside baseball and you go, Oh my God, I can't believe he did that. It's uh, we, well, my wife and I were driving to a show one time in Connecticut. It had to be 80 degrees outside. Maybe mm-hmm. it was 80. Actually it was 83, I think. And we're going by and there's a, there's a bank building and it had one of those big clocks outside yes. with the temperature and the time. We went by the clock. It went from 83 to 41. No kidding. <laughs> and then it went back. Right. My wife was driving home, and it was a radar unit there. She was right behind the car, and that car went by. It was 25. She was right behind him, same speed. It went to 41 and then went away. Your boy, uh, I'm sure he is looking for the most creative ways. He's still got, we, we keep our sense of humors and our personalities and all that. And I'm sure he's very busy helping other people, maybe young people cross as well. I mean, it just seems like he's, he's busy in a good way. It, it really is. Um, I can, I can tell you this. I can't show it to you because we're, we're radio, but I want to tell you this other story. I don't think it'll have the impact it does if I showed you the picture, but, um, the year uh, that Nikki passed, it came to be his brother Chris's birthday. And uh, Chris was obsessed with videotaping Nikki at every part of his life. Uh, on stage, in the yard, in the house, in the backyard, in the car, in the bathroom. <laughs> Don't ask. Um, <laughs> and, and, and he was, and so the year it came, that year it came to be his birthday and, and he asked for a new video camera. Now, I wanted to get a, a Sony because I'm a big spender. Uh, well, they're $10 more, but that's okay. Um, and my wife said, no, no, he wants a Samsung. He wants a Samsung. I said, okay. So we get him a Samsung. And we're all in the car going to the restaurant. There's about six of us in the car. And it's wonderful now because you buy somebody a present. You don't have to wrap it. You just put it in a bag. That's right. And then a you put tissue. A, you know, put a bunch of toilet paper on top. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's really good. And so we had gotten him. So he takes out his camera and he and he starts opening his his the box and he says to his mom, I guess this year I ha- I forgot to tell you every year when it was Chris's birthday. He would let Nikki blow out his candles. How sweet. It was a tradition they had. Right. So 
Chris is taking the camera out. He's opening and he says to his mom, I guess this year I have to blow out my own candles. And on the top of the box inside was a brochure from Samsung. And he opened it up. And on the cover of the brochure was a picture, giant picture of a little boy blowing out the candles on a birthday cake. Oh. Now that's pretty cool. Yes. Here's the part where I wish I could show you. The boy is a dead ringer for Nikki. So much so that on my uh, in my presentation I have uh, a picture of Nikki about a year when a year older than that boy standing at a at a birthday cake and they're identical. I mean the the faces are identical. So much so that my wife was convinced that this was from, of Nikki from a, a Disney cruise that we went on. Well, for six years, I chased Samsung. It took me six years to find somebody who would actually talk to me because they were afraid that they had run a picture of my son without permission and they were going to have to pay money. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that too. <laughs> uh, finally, I got a hold of an executive, a female, of course, who had the brilliance to listen to me for a minute. I explained the story to her. And she said, Mr. Kane, uh, I'm going to have the photographer call you. The following Tuesday morning at 1141, mm -hmm. I got a call from this photographer. He said, Mr. Kane, we took these pictures uh, in San Diego uh, to, to have a, you know, birthday pictures. He said, I will send these to you. And you can see all the pictures so because they wanted to prove to me it wasn't my son on a Disney cruise. And when I got the pictures in none of the other pictures, does Nikki look like this boy as he does in this one picture from that shoot? Happy birthday, Chris. <laughs> that is just amazing. You know, it's interesting for the non-believers and the skeptics, because I was one. I still am, you know, with some things. But when you think that we are hurling around this never-ending universe with billions of planets and stars, and we don't understand how things work. There's an invisible universe around us with these... GPS signals, Wi-Fi signals, radio waves. There's sure. A, and, and even, Dave, down to our tiniest little atom inside of our cells, all there is is vibrating energy. There's no, there's no thing. If we had a teeny tiny camera, we would be invisible if we go down to our smallest piece. So, yeah, well, think about it. I mean, if... if Look at the people even that you just work with. Look at the people in some of the people in your family. Mm -hmm. Do you and look at yourself? I look at myself and I think this is the best God can do. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, there's so much more. So much as you were saying, there's so much more here. And we're blocking it all. We're blocking it. And and that's the serious importance of it. To let people know your loved ones don't die. I never say die. I say past. Yes. I never say die. Here's another thing, by the way. We never, we, we have taught her. Now, we had to teach ourselves. We talk about Nikki in present tense. You can you can order a pizza and as you're eating and say, boy, Nikki used to love this pizza. Nikki still loves this pizza. Mm -hmm. So we have talked in present tense. We set a place for Nikki at our table every time we eat, not because we think he's going to say pass the salt, but because because we are acknowledging that we believe he is still with us always. That's right. And so we always have a place for Nikki. You know, I mean, and that sounds like people think that we think that he's sitting there, you know, eating a steak. No, we just say, I we remember you, Nick. We got it right here. Right. It's like bringing home leftovers for your family. You know, you say, uh, you remember them, you know, it's, and that's what we do. Yeah. There's a girl that I know that uh, her and her mom were really interested in this afterlife talk and they, they loved the medium, um, John Edwards. And they yeah. said, if he ever comes around, we're going to go, go see him. Well, 
Unfortunately, the mother developed brain cancer and died just a few months later. So John Edwards came to town and the daughter just felt like, I've got to go. This was mom and I, our agreement. So the father goes with her. Now, he doesn't believe in any of this. And, of course, he's right. grieving the, the um, passing of his wife. So John uh, comes to them and says, you know, we, I've got a woman here. And she's saying she's the mom and she's the wife. And she died of uh, brain cancer, et cetera, and so forth. It said some very, very specific things to the daughter. She could take it all. Turned to the father and said, she was with you yesterday as you were walking by the water. You sat on a bench and someone in drag dressed up as little Bo Peep started hitting on <laughs> this man. And it came out of his mouth, you know, identical to what happened. Now, you can't make this this up. The father's life was changed. Their anniversary came. He bought two tickets to the opera, which the wife loved, left the empty seat. She was with him. They set a space at the table for the wife. Same kind of thing. But talk about those things that take us from a hope to knowing that they're still around. So I love that. And I think we should do all do this. You know, keep it's more than keeping a memory alive as they are alive. Yeah, you just it's can't not see keeping them. a memory, right? It's not a memory. It's, uh, people say, "Oh, we're gonna have a memorial." Bull crap! He's here, right here. Right. I mean, a memorial. He's here. See, this this is how we've been trained. That's we've right. been trained. We say lost. I the only time I the only reason I use the word lost is so people will know what I'm talking about. That's right. But we have been trained. You know, Bob. Do you remember the comedian Bobcat Goldthwait? Yes. Yes. Bobcat Goldthwait, I say this in my in my show. We talk about lost. If you lost your car keys, would you look for them? That's I mean, come perfect. on, right? Yes. I mean, come on. You you, you can't find your glasses. You're walking all over the house. What? You're not looking for your son. Mm -hmm. You're not looking for your mom. You're not staying open. Bobcat Goldthwait in his act used to say, "I lost my job." He didn't say, "I lost my." He said, "Well, I didn't lose it. I know where it is. It's just when I go there, somebody else is doing it." Right. <laughs> And then after in his act, he says, I lost my girl. He said, well, I didn't lose her. I know where she is. But just when I go there, somebody else is, well, never mind. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. And, and this is why we have been trained to talk in past tense. We have been trained to look up when we say, I know you're there, mom. You're looking up and she's standing behind you. You're looking up and she's holding your hand. We, we, this is how we have been trained. That, that you know, and and this is the problem of that stands in the way of people rethinking. They've got to learn to rethink. They've got to act first. Think about it. You know, in in scripture it says, "Act as if ye had faith." Well, act as if ye believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> act uh, and and speak. Talk to your loved one. My wife will talk to Nikki out loud, no matter where she is. If she feels them, if she's, she'll just talk to him. We talk to him all the time. I, I I know he's in this room with me right now. I know that he figured, he he leads me to people. He has brought us to people. Let me give you an example. Uh, John Land is an author. He's a famous, he's an internationally known thriller writer. Okay. okay? Uh, and he's from Rhode Island. He read about Nikki and he contacted us. And we showed him Nikki's play that I told you about, They Walk Among Us. Mm -hmm. He wanted to re he wanted to expand the play into a feature length motion picture. And he asked permission to be able to do something. So we said, sure, of course, go ahead. So he added s several, you know, characters and subplots and da da da. When Chris looked at the play, when he, his first script you know, of the film, excuse me. John added people in his film. The character names were all people in Nikki's life. And John never knew Nikki. John knew nothing about Nikki until he met us. Amazing. And yet he was able to make characters with the names of people in Nikki's important in Nikki's life. They, and, and, and huh? they come to us through our imagination and we chalk it up. Oh, it's just our imagination. But that's, that's the faculty that they use, you know, so yeah. write these things yeah. down. I, 
Yeah, I'm so happy to talk to you, Dave. <laughs> well, I hope so, because I'm doing the best I can. Here. You're and, doing and... fabulous. Tell us about your book, because now, obviously, in an hour, we can't go all through right. all the signs. Well, we have, but we have the book. where can we well, find all, it? Say, 41 yeah, Signs of oh, Hope. You can get it online. You can get it from uh, Amazon. Okay. Uh, it's a Kindle book, and it's a, you know, get a, get a hard copy as mm-hmm. well. It's called 41 Signs of Hope. And basically, it's a very simple read. It's not a big book. It's a thin book. Because once I gave all these examples, having more stories from Nick would kind of be redundant for the purpose that I wrote the book. I wrote the book so people would think about it. So people would get validation. Yes. So they'd realize they're not imagining things, that it's real. And Nikki's signs are huge. They're like billboards, as you can as you can see. I'm sure that you you feel that at all the people you've interviewed. I mean, this is unbelievable. And people say to me, "Well, I don't get signs." Well, you do get signs, but you're not realizing it. You're not acknowledging them. You're not seeing them. Um, license plates are 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 a big thing. Mm-hmm. Numbers at the right time songs, music. You're driving to Stop and Shop and you think about your Aunt Tilly and when you walk in the Stop Shop, her favorite song is playing on the music. Mm -hmm. That's her saying she's thinking of you. But you go, oh, wow, isn't that it? I was just talking about her. Okay, and then you you go go to the Kumquats or something. I mean, we got to train ourselves. So the name of the book is 41 Signs of Hope. Um, And you can get it on Amazon as a Kindle or as a hardcover book. Also, there is the movie. It's an award-winning documentary called 41. This is not the one about George Bush. This is the other one. And it is, you see Nikki from, in the movie, you see him from the time he's wearing the 41 on his cap to moments before he passes. We have the video of the fire inside. You can see as the fire begins and the camera pans to the left, you can see Nikki in the front row standing right at the stage. Uh, we know exactly where he was. And, and it is amazing to watch this boy. And all of the time that Chris videotaped him, you see him on stage. You see him performing. He was a terrific actor. Uh, you see him. It, it, it just it, It's a great movie. It's almost two hours, and it's worth every moment of it. Very good. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not doing it to sell because I have no piece of the 41. No. I don't, you know, while I produce, you know, I'll help produce it. But I mean, you know, this, this is owned, that motion picture is owned by a company that gets money and that's fine. I wanted to get the story out. That's right. That's right. And right. now your new book, Your Stories. The new book is going to be 41 of Signs of Hope, Your Stories. And I want people to write to me and just tell me their story. And then I may contact them to get details of the details. For instance, if your if your dad was a baseball player or really into baseball, you know, and uh, suddenly uh, you walk out of your house and there's a there's a baseball bat on your front lawn, you know, I need to know that that baseball had a significant part in your loved one's life, so I can give a little background, you right. know, so so the so that the story will have the impact it has. Well, not to, to, but maybe to the to the writer, but but you want to give as much impact to the story as possible, That's and right. validation as possible. So I'll edit a little bit in the sense of for presentation, you know. Uh, but I want to make sure these people read it and then feel, oh yeah, that's the story. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So that people reading it will get like they do out of Forty One Signs of Hope, get the the lift. The lift. And, I'm, and and I even hesitate to say I wrote the book. I didn't write this book. I didn't write this book any more than a reporter writes down that there was a car accident. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am just telling the stories as they happened. This is not a novel. It's a it's a rendition uh, and a telling of the of the real story. Wonderful. What's the best way to contact you if somebody has a story? Very simple. Um, all of my contact information is at davecane.net. It's K-A-N-E, Dave, K-A-N-E dot net. Feel free to write to me. Feel free to call me. My phone number's there. Uh, I did an, an interview with Bob Olson uh, on YouTube three years ago. I'm still hearing from people from all over the world. That's right. Afterlife TV. It's a great one. Yeah, well, I I did it with him. I think it's almost four years now, 
And I have heard from Sweden and England and Germany and Japan and you name it. I've heard from people and so many of these people. Now, you know, I got to tell you, if I dreamt about my son, I would say I dreamt about my son. People are writing to me or calling me and saying, I dreamt about my son and your son was in the dream. We have been told by so many mediums, and it is another thing to check out, by the way. So many mediums have told us the very same thing that other mediums have told us. You know, like you check, you know, you cross check. Right. right? So um, when after we went to Robert Brown in New York, our son, Chris, went to see him in Long Island. We went, we went to Manhattan to see him. And several weeks later, he went to Long Island. And Robert Brown didn't know that we were related in any way. Didn't even think of us. And Robert Brown told him almost the identical stuff he told us about Nikki. I mean, it was unbelievable that that this kid was really here. So people need to know that that it's real. And um, the book is just meant to do that for you. The new book, I want you to feel free to contact me. Send me your, your stories and I'll do what I can. It might take a little while because I got a feeling I'm going to get my door knocked on quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, just a little bit. The phone oh, might I ring too. <laughs> yeah, about the, the Bob Olson thing. I mean, I'm getting calls in the middle of the night from different time zones yes. <laughs> around the world, you know. So And so that has been a big – now that was brought to me. All of the people that have been brought to me, all, uh, uh, to our family to help us, uh, people like Bob Olson and Robert Brown and, and Maureen Hancock, et cetera. Right. Very interesting. Very cool. Um, and I want people to know. Have we got another minute? We do. And then um, I'm going to ask you for some closing words and then okay. also some closing words that you think Nikki would say to give people a little hope about life. Sure. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that um, Maureen Hancock, you know, we're all talking about Nick and we're talking about the, and we're talking about mediumship. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you about mediumship. My stun. When we went to see Maureen Hancock, Maureen Hancock uh, is, of course, doing great things now. And she has always done free readings for parents who have lost a child. Mm-hmm. Now it's been very tough because there's so many requests, et cetera. But when we went to her, and I'm just it's about mediumship, when we went to her, We sat down. We didn't know her. She didn't know us. And she looked at me and said, Joe is Joe came through. Joe wants to talk to you. And I said, me? She said, yeah, there's a Joe here. There's a Joe here. I I pointed at my wife. My wife is Joanne. Her father is Joseph. Her brother is Joseph. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm pointing to her. I'm saying, no, no, it's her. She said, no, it's you. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, and I said, I don't know who that is. And she said, well, let me see what I can do. And then she said to me, Vietnam. Well, my friend Joe was was killed in Vietnam. But here's the thing. The day before, I happened to have happened. I happened to have come on his obituary in my papers. And I showed it to Joanne. And I said, look, this is Joe that I tell you about all the time. And when we go to see Maureen Hancock, that's who shows up first in the reading. Is that stunning? Incredible. I mean, so I just want to let people know, you know, it, it's real. It happens. The only thing I will tell you is what, what I say at the end of my presentation is uh, there's a great writing called Death is Nothing at All. Yes. Uh, look it up. Uh, you can get on the internet, I'm sure. Death is Nothing at All. I am I and you are you. What we were to each other, we still are. Uh, And this is what Nikki would tell you. How we will laugh at the sorrow we had when we realize that all of this is is really nothing. We're all safe. We're all loved. We're all going to be just fine. And as as Nikki's place, in the end, everything, and I do mean everything, is going to be just fine. And that's Nikki's story. And as Nikki would say, That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. (laughs) Beautiful. Dave, thank you from the bottom of all of our hearts for being our guest today. Thank you for listening, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm really thrilled to to be with you. Uh, Let's do it again down the road sometime, maybe when we get the book up and running. 
the other book, we can do something. I love that idea. And for parents listening, there's also a great organization. Maureen Hancock was just recently gave a free demonstration with them called helpingparentsheal.org. And they're just amazing, just amazing. And it's one of the few, it's much more than grief support because they wholeheartedly embrace the reality of the afterlife. And they do helping parents what? Helping parents heal. Heal. org. They're absolutely great. And uh, maybe you can speak with them sometime. I can set that up. Oh, absolutely. That's why I'm writing it down here. I didn't know about this. uh, I have all the connections you need. I know you do. I know you do. (laughs) By the way, thanks for that TV you gave me from from your trunk of your car. It was really good. Absolutely. I've got all kinds of stuff as I clean out the house. You're a funny man. (laughs) And for our (laughs) listener, thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. Whether this is your first or you've been around for 300 plus episodes, Episodes. All episodes are available at we don't die radio.com. They're also on YouTube and the last hundred of them are on iTunes. So you have almost a year's worth of listening to do. If you're just starting out and you want some good evidence, help through grief and good reasons to believe that life never ends and your life is important. Also, you can join what I call my insiders club. And that's a nice word for nice words for my email list. And you can find that on the website as well. When you do, you get a free copy of my book, We Don't Die in a PDF form. Although it only says the first few chapters, it's the whole book. And there's also a very healing audio called How to Survive Grief. And if you'd like a free copy of my audio book, simply go to we don't die radio.com, click on store and find the audiobook and just type in coupon code free F R E E. And like I said, we have a new calendar there. Also, we're doing free Sunday services and we believe in the evidence of the afterlife. So not just a little prayer and music readings and a, I'd say a sermon, but it's more uplifting than anything heavy, but we have some mediums at the end of every service do medium readings on our online audience. And we have some of the best in the world. So it's really magnificent. So check out our calendar. And then if you're a Facebook user, you can type in we don't die listeners. And it's a great place to meet like minded new friends be supported. There's so many people around many of us that don't believe in anything we talk about here, and they're not willing to open their mind just yet. Um, But they will someday. But please join us. And it's a, it's just really a nice way to have a a community. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I'm always so happy to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. (music) 